Welcome attendees to the San Antonio Book Festival. This is our four o'clock session, rewriting women's roles in fiction. We're happy you're here. Um, today we have with us two authors who have written fabulous uh, historical fiction, Anna North and S. Kirk Walsh. I'd like to tell you a little bit about this session and then we're going to move into each author um, introducing themselves and we are very lucky that they are going to give us an excerpt. Um, throughout the years, novelists have been rethinking and reanimating the roles of young women and how they might step into different roles and worlds, particularly during earlier times. Um, in 2021, two novels do a notable job of this. In Anna North's Outlaw, which I have right here, set in the Old West, on the day of her wedding, 17-year-old Ada's life looks good. She loves her husband, and she loves working as an apprentice to her mother, a respected midwife. But after a year of marriage and no pregnancy in a town where barren women are routinely hanged as witches, her survival depends on leaving behind everything she knows. Um, and in The Elephant of Belfast uh, by S. Kirk Walsh, it's a vivid and moving story of a young woman zookeeper and the elephant she's compelled to protect through the German blitz of Belfast during World War II. And it speaks not only to the tragedy of the times, but also to the ongoing sectarian tensions that still exist in Northern Ireland today. Um, these are perfect for readers of historical and literary fiction alike. So welcome to our authors. Um, we're gonna start um, with Anna North. Anna, um, if you would go ahead and give us um, a taste of your work and we would be happy to hear it. Sure. So thanks so much for having me. Um, thanks to all of you for, for coming um, and for watching this. I'm so excited to talk more about our books. Um, so I'll tell you a tiny bit about Outlawed and then I'll just read a little bit. Um, so one way to think about Outlawed is as a revisionist Western. It's also, I think of it as a feminist Western. Um, it's set in 1894, but not our 1894. This is an alternate history. Um, in this world, a devastating flu pandemic has swept the world in the year 1830, um, destroying the United States government and the state governments. Um, the descendants of the survivors live in independent towns, kind of dotted throughout what used to be the U.S. Um, they become really obsessed with reproduction, so both to kind of replace those who have died and also to um, provide a sense of hope amid so much death. And so in this sort of reproduction obsessed world, um, People who are infertile are really deeply stigmatized, especially women. Um, they can even be hanged as witches. Um, and sorry, if, if you uh, if you hear some loudness during this, uh, that's just my toddler um, who is very high spirited. Um, anyway, <laughs> um, in this world, we follow Ada, um, who is a young apprentice midwife um, at the age of 17. Um, Ada gets married. But after a year uh, of marriage, she's not pregnant. And so she starts being scapegoated for problems in her town. Um, she's not safe and ends up having to flee. She joins up with the mysterious Hole in the Wall gang, a gang of outlaws based on the real life Hole in the Wall gang. Um, but this gang is a little different. Um, and she's going to have to decide whether to go along with the dangerous plan they have to create sort of a haven for outcast women um, or whether she wants to kind of go her own way and seek her own safety. Um, and so I'm just going to read you a tiny bit from the beginning. Um, you don't have to know anything uh, going in because this is just the very beginning. So here we go. Chapter one. In the year of our Lord, 1894, I became an outlaw. Like a lot of things, it didn't happen all at once. First, I had to get married. I felt lucky on the day of my wedding dance. At 17, I wasn't the first girl in my class to marry, but I was one of them. And my husband was a handsome boy from a good family. He had three siblings like me, and his mama was one of seven. Did I love him? We used to say we loved our beaus, my girlfriends and I. I remember spending hours talking about his broad shoulders, his awkward but charming dancing, the bashful way he always said my name. The first few months of my marriage were sweet ones. My husband and I were hungry for each other all the time. In ninth form, when the girls and boys were separated to prepare us for married life, Mrs. Spencer had explained to us that it would be our duty to lie with our husbands regularly so that we could have children for baby Jesus. We already knew about the children part. 
We had read Burton's Lessons of the Infant Jesus Christ every year since third form, so we had heard about how God sent the great flu to cleanse the world of evil, just like he'd sent the flood so many centuries before. We knew that baby Jesus had appeared to Mary of Texarkana after the sickness had killed nine out of every ten men, women, and children from Boston to California and struck a covenant with her. If those who remained were fruitful and peopled the world in his image, he would spare them further sickness, and they and their descendants forever after would be precious to him. But in ninth form, we learned about lying with our husbands, how we should wash beforehand and put perfume behind our ears, how we should breathe slowly to relax our muscles and try to look our husbands in the eyes, how we'd bleed. Don't worry, Mrs. Spencer said then, smiling at us. It only hurts in the beginning. After a while, you'll start to like it. There's nothing more joyful than two people joining together to make a child. My husband did not know what to do at first, but he took his responsibility seriously, and what he lacked in experience he made up for in ardor. We lived with his parents while he saved for a house. In the mornings, his mother made little jokes about how soon I'd be eating for two. During the day, I still attended births with my mama. I was the eldest and the only one who actually wanted to learn about breech births and morning sickness and childbed fever, so I was the one who would take over for Mama when she got too old. When I came on rounds with my new wedding ring, the mothers-to-be winked and teased me. It's good you're learning about all this now, said Alma Bunting, 40 years old, pregnant with her sixth child and suffering from hemorrhoids. Then you won't be surprised when it's your turn. I just laughed. I was not like my friend Ula, who had eight baby names picked out, four boys and four girls. When I was 10 and my sister B was two months old, my Mama had gone to bed and stayed there for a year. So I had already been a mama. I had changed a baby, fed her from a bottle when mama couldn't nurse, soothed her at night when I was still young enough to be afraid of the dark. I was not in a rush to do it again. I knew from working with mama that sometimes it could take months, even for a young girl like me, and I was happy to sleep with my new husband and still sneak off sometimes to drink Juneberry wine behind the Peterson's barn with Ula and Susie and Mary Alice and not have to worry about anyone except for me. I'll stop there. Thank you so much. Thank you. We also have um, as Kirk Walsh and, and um, forgive me if we're not saying this earlier. We have um, Anna North is a, a graduate of Iowa Writers Workshop. I'm always fascinated by that. Anna. Um, she's also you've also authored two previous novels, right? America Pacifica and The Life and Death of Sophie Stark, which received a Lambda Literary Award in 2016. Um, Anna, you also write for Jezebel, BuzzFeed, Salon, and the New York Times. And so when we get to later part of the session, I really want to ask both of our authors um, how their previous works um, contribute to, you know, how they think of ideas for historical fiction, especially these two time periods. Um, as Kirk Walsh is a writer living in Austin. Her work has been widely published in the New York Times Book Review, Long Reads, Story Quarterly, and Electric Literature, among other publications. Over the years, she has been a resident at UCross, Yaddo, Ragdale, and Virginia Center for the Creative Arts. Walsh is the founder of Austin Bat Cave, a writing and tutoring center that provides free writing workshops for young writers throughout Austin. The Elephant of Belfast is her first novel. Um, so thank you, S. Kirk Walsh, for joining us. Um, also, you can um, tell us a little bit about the book and give us some context for the excerpt you'll, you'll share with us today. Okay, thank you for having me. Um, thanks, Patricia, for the introduction. And thanks to the San Antonio Book Festival for pivoting to being online during the pandemic. Um, it's really meaningful to be able to connect with readers despite uh, the constraints right now and to be on this panel with Anna. Um, so my book was published this week and yeah, I um, we can talk. <laughs> Actually, Anna's book was published on January 5th of this year, um, which, yeah, before another day <laughs> of events. And yeah. Um, yeah, so my book was published this week on April 6th, which actually um, was Easter Tuesday, and a major event in my novel is the Easter Tuesday bombings that ha happened in Belfast, Northern Ireland. And my story begins um, 
in the fall, uh, a few months before that, in October of 1940, and it follows, as Patricia said, a young zookeeper named Hattie Quinn. And at the opening scene, she's seen a young three-year-old elephant being lifted from a steamer. And the elephants walked up the Antrim Road, which is one of the main arteries in the city. And uh, the first half of the book really just kind of shows day-to-day -day life. And then uh, about a third of the way through, uh, the bombings occur. And so my book is inspired by real-life events um, by a young woman named Denise Austin. <laughs> has the same last name as the city I live in now. But um, I borrowed a lot of what happened from the real events, and I made a lot of it, too. So, similar to how Anna described it, it is a kind of alternate history to what happened in some respects and in other respects it's very true to the events that happened in Belfast and at the Belfast Zoo. And I'm just going to read a couple of paragraphs. So this is actually midway through the book and I just decided to read this section because this week was Easter Tuesday and it's the anniversary the 80th anniversary of the Blitz uh, this year. And so the bombings, um, this is the second round of bombings that has occurred of the Germans flying overhead. And Hetty is running up to the zoo. Um, you know, that's her impulse is to run to the zoo and see how Violet is doing amid the falling bombs. Um, so that's where I'm picking up. And the only thing you need to know is Thomas, is the name of her father and he's abandoned the family and before the novel her sister died in childbirth her name is Anna. Hetty ran towards the zoo's rear entrance as the sky lit up again. She unlocked the padlock and flung the gate open. At the elephant house Hetty found Violet pacing the yard. As Hetty slowed to approach the elephant her ribs aching from the run the acrid smell of fresh dung hit her like a slap in the face. Violet released a deep guttural, guttural cry. I'm here, Vi, Hetty said softly. I'm here. Light gathered and scattered in the sky. Hetty heard the continuous drone of aircraft. Dozens of bombers were up there now, and they all seemed to be approaching from the northeast along the shores of the Belfast Lock and flying directly over the Whitewell Road. Hetty rubbed Violet absently behind one of her ears. The elephant skin felt cold and clammy. She rested her cheek against Violet's heaving side and rubbed the elephant behind her ear again, speaking softly to, softly to her, the way that Thomas used to whisper to Hetty when she couldn't fall asleep when a thunderstorm rolled over their neighborhood. Only then did she notice the wall of animal cries and howls that surrounded the elephant house. It was different from, different than the other night, louder, fiercer, and it came from all sides. Like everything was escalating to another level, another volume, another rung of fear, another circle of violence. As Hetty listened, the fine hairs on the nape of her neck stood on end. The animal's calls gained more definition. The growls of the lions and the leopards, the roars of the black bears, the cackles of the hyenas, the shrieks of the monkeys and the baboons, the brays of the sea lions, the squawks of the toucans and the macaws. It was as if a call and response were taking place between the animals and the shadows and the darkness transformed into its own mythic cathedral with all its devout congregants praying in their own distinctive tongues at the sacred altar of their greater animal god, with hopes of reaching a higher state, a higher consciousness, so they could endure this suffering of higher proportions. They were singing, singing to something. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both for sharing those excerpts with us. Um, to our audience, 
Um, if during this session you would like to answer a question, we just want to remind you that on the right side of your screen, um, there is a chat, but also a Q&A box, and you can put your questions there um, if you'd like our authors to answer those. I um, have a couple of questions. I, I'm lucky enough to have received these books um, early on, as, as Kirk Waltz said, hers just came out, but um, because I'm lucky enough to be a moderator for your session, I received them. So there are so many parallels um, between these books. And um, so I'd like to ask a question that applies to both of the novels. Um, animals come up in both of them, and they save the characters, you know, to a degree. Um, in Outlawed, Anna knows cows, but she has trouble getting her horse Amity to traverse a rocky patch. And another character, Texas, tells her, you learn from Amity, the horse, not the other way around. Right. So humans learn from animals then. Um, in The Elephant of Belfast, Hetty and her boss, Mr. Wright, they both share the knowledge that caring for the animals in the Belfast Zoo has saved them from their grief. They're each grieving um, a family member. So I want to ask both the authors, um, did you have to research the characteristics of these animals um, for the elephant of Belfast? Well, they have the Belfast Zoo. So there's the elephants, um, the seals, uh, you know, the penguins, all these other things. And Ada, in your book, um, the horses and the cows. So how did you research this theme or come to write about this symbiotic relationship between animals and humans? Do you want to go first? Uh, sure. Um, so I, it was a lot of work because <laughs> the elephant is a big character. And I was struck, um, you know, what you mentioned about Anna's novel, you know, not having, you know, letting the horse lead. Um, mm -hmm. and, and so with my book, um, the elephant is mostly inspired by a real life elephant. Um, who was named Sheila, which is what the S stands in my name. That was just sort of a coincidence. But there was a elephant that preceded her um, called Daisy, who arrived by steamer to Belfast. It was the first kind of big animal for back then. It was called the Bellevue Zoo, and they walked her up the Antrim Road. So I kind of borrowed her story. And they, uh, there was a stick, which I also have this detail in my novel of lead me with this. And there's a historical image of Daisy walking with about four young men. And so my elephant research happened at the Houston Zoo. They have a pretty big Asian elephant family and I was really lucky. But I did show that photo um, to the large mammal curator, Daryl Hoffman. And his comment to me was, it looks like she's leading them, not the other way around. And so, um, you know, that's a bit of the tension, I think, in any animal human relationship is, you know, who's leading who. And with the elephants themselves, I will, will say, like my visits to the Houston Zoo, I actually wrote a piece um, for Texas Monthly about that research, but they let me wash a three-year-old elephant, which is the age of my elephant in the book. They let me witness um, trainings and feedings. And there was one very memorable scene during my second visit where they did an ultrasound of a pregnant female named Tess. And they couldn't do it through the skin of the elephant because their skin is too thick. And so like four or five zookeepers, um, you know, they had to clean out her rectum to put the ultrasound inside the elephant. And it was a messy operation, not to say. And they, the zookeepers were so calm and respectful of the animal. And I felt like, and then the chief veterinarian came and did the ultrasound. Um, it was a baby girl. Unfortunately, um, that baby miscarried, uh, but mm -hmm. they, she ended up having another one. But I felt like watching that, operation gave me almost all the information I needed about a relationship between a zookeeper and an animal. But it, and I'm sure um, it might have been similar for Anna, but even though it, it took a lot to develop the relationship between Heidi and Violet, it, it's 
it's the most important relationship in the book. And I, I guess for me as the writer, one of the challenges was trying to bring kind of the contradictions and complexity of a human to human relationship to that relationship. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, <clears throat> that's all. It's, that's fascinating that you're able to get behind the scenes in the zoo like that. Um, that's that's really that's so cool. Um, it's been interesting. It's interesting to hearing you talk. My aunt was actually a zookeeper for a number of years, so she has like all these funny anecdotes wow. about like what animal bite is the worst. She says a seal bite is the worst because like seals have some kind of bacteria in their mouth that will give you like a really horrible infection. So don't get bitten by a seal. Um, but I didn't. Um, I didn't get you know the kind of the level of maybe behind the scenes with horses that you're talking about um i did do a lot of research on horses for the book there's a lot of um you know in particular like ada has a close relationship with her horse amity and in general the members of the hole in the wall gang the outlaws all have close relationships with their horses and the horses all have names um and are sort of characters um and i did do a fair amount of research um it's been a really long time since I was on a horse. Um, I wanted to, you know, do some horseback riding as research for the book. But by the time I sort of realized, like, maybe I should do that, then I was pregnant. And I was like frantically Googling, like, can you ride a horse while pregnant? And it's like people probably do it the world over. But I was like, didn't want to chance it, I guess. Um, but I just did a bunch of reading. Um, you know, I mean, like that was some of the most fun research in some ways was the research on horses, um, you know, just even learning about the parts of the horse or learning about how to care for a horse. Um, a good friend of mine is actually, um, is a horse trainer in Los Angeles. And, um, you know, so I talked to her a little bit and just had, you know, had been talking to her about her horses for many years. So like a little bit absorbed by osmosis, but it was a lot of Googling. Um, I remember spending a long time, like trying to figure out exactly what a curry comb is for and what you do with it and like what the verb is for like curry comb. Like I remember my copy editor was really like concerned that I'd used the wrong verb and that I was like not not using, I, Ada was using the curry comb incorrectly and we were spending a really long time like trying to drill down and figure all that out. But that part was really fun. I enjoyed like, um, you know, going to horse websites and learning about horse ailments and horse horse things. That was That was a joy. Okay, I see. Thank you. Okay. Oh, there's just one book um, that I pulled off that I did uh, read while I was writing was uh, How Animals Grieve by mm. Barbara King, who's um, yeah well known in the animal world. And certain, like Anna said, like reading experts, it was a lot of yeah. I had to learn a lot. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much. Um, in each of these novels, the young female characters struggle with self-assuredness. Um, Hetty in The Elephant of Belfast, she really wants to distinguish herself from her late sister, Anna. Uh, and probably because um, your book states that they looked so much alike, they were thought to be twins, even though they were not. And then also because she wants to become uh, the first and only female zookeeper. Um, and I think, you know, the events of World War II kind of positioned that for her, right? Um, Ada in Outlawed wants to establish that she and lots of other young women can be more than just a wife. Um, and she takes on also multiple roles. She becomes, you know, the doctor, um, an outlaw with the hole in the wall gang. Um, how did you write and decide to express these roles um, the young narrator, or rather main characters, have to negotiate in your novels? Um, yeah, this is a great question. I, I think for me, you know, for Ada, a lot just flows out of the situation she finds herself in. So, you know, it's interesting to think about, like, what would this character have done if she were able to have children? Um, and probably I would imagine that she sh she would have stayed in her town and followed in her mother's footsteps as a midwife, um, you know, and perhaps like taken on other research or things like this. But she certainly wouldn't have had to become an outlaw. So some of it is just sort of situational. Um, but I mean, the other part for me was, you know, and, and a big part of trying to get the book to come together and trying to get it to sort of make sense in my mind was thinking about what drives Ada. And it was important for me to think about what drives her more than just needing to save herself because she does need to do that. She's in a lot of danger. She could be killed. Her family could be killed. She has to get out of town. Um, and once people know that she's a quote unquote barren woman, there's, you know, there's really nowhere that she's 100 percent safe. 
Um, but beyond just wanting to, you know, not get hanged, basically, I knew I needed, and, you know, my writing group was very clear with me that I needed to have some motivation for her beyond that. Um, and so I thought a lot about what makes her tick, and ultimately for her, it's really a, a search for knowledge. And so, you know, she's at, like in the excerpt that I read, you know, she has three sisters, but she's the only one who is really excited about becoming a midwife. And part of that is wanting to take care of people. But a big part of it is wanting to understand, wanting to understand the body, wanting to understand birth, wanting to understand illness. Um, and that carries over even after she's forced to leave. And so when she's with the gang, you know, I won't reveal too much about the plot, but she certainly still has to use her medical training. Um, and then throughout the book, she's really concerned with trying to figure out, well, you know, why is she not able to conceive a child? Why are some people not able to conceive children? You know, what is sort of what's behind um, fertility and infertility? And for her, this is really not just about learning for herself, but she believes that if she can answer these questions, she can end some of the stigma around infertility in her society. Um, I think the book sets, I tried to set up a little bit of attention with that because I think, you know, there are ways in which information and knowledge are so powerful to end stigma and marginalization, and there are ways in which they're not. Um, you know, in the last year, we've seen a lot of times efforts to share information and knowledge and those efforts really being rejected. Um, so there are times when Ada's work is rejected too, or when Ada sort of tries an approach with her search for knowledge that's not that effective, and she can kind of get herself and other people in trouble. Um, but that was really, I think, her animating principle for me. Um, you know, was that she wants, you know, yes, she wants to carve out a place for herself and a place for other women, but really she wants to use, she wants to use her medical knowledge as, as a way of doing that. Um, and I guess the only other thing I'll say just on the topic of sort of rewriting women's roles is that I wanted to, with this book, I didn't want to write a dystopia necessarily. My first book is more of a straightforward dystopia. And with this one, I just really wanted to tell sort of an alternate story about an alternate world. And so in this world, women face a lot of things they don't necessarily face in our world or they face things more severely. You know, people do experience a lot of stigma around infertility in the United States today, but they're, it's not a crime. Um, you know, they're not going to be prosecuted. Um, but there's also things in the world of outlawed that I, I think, um, if not better, are at least different. So, you know, for example, I portray women who are midwives or women who have a lot of children as actually gaining higher status in this world than maybe maybe women had in real life 1894. Um, you know, so in the book, what I wanted to do was not necessarily again, not necessarily paint just like a terrible and dark version of the world, but paint a version of the world where like everything was a little bit shifted or twisted. Um, and that includes the roles that women are allowed to have. Right. Yeah, so I, um, well, I just want to say I really appreciated how you animated her curiosity. I think that's a hard thing to do in fiction and it felt so alive on the page. and. I think for me with Hetty, so aspects of her character, as I said, are borrowed from the real life person who informed the character, Denise Austin, who uh, never had children, um, never married. And in her story, she ended up taking care of her parents and had in some ways a limited life, but she did end up traveling, but she was in fact the first female zookeeper and in 1940, 1941, women were not doing that and they were mostly becoming mothers, um, you know, do, doing like being in a typing pool. And it was, you know, because of the war, she was able to uh, get that job because some of the young men uh, joined the effort. And so, yeah, it was, I think one of the challenging aspects of the book was um, to find agency in limited circumstances and kind of, um, yeah, so I actually ex experienced infertility myself and a part of why, I mean, Hetty's only 20 years old, so she has a bit more of her procreating years in front of her, but she's clearly deciding that that's not the route she wants to go. And I come from a very, 
a, a large Irish Catholic family on my dad's side and procreation is highly valued and um, you know, there were times in my 30s when I was going through this struggle where I did feel invisible and I felt on the margins of this extended family. You know, that said, there are other people in my family who don't have kids. Um, but I think a part of it was Hetty's trajectory of going from being invisible to visible for herself. And, you know, in the book, how that happens is through crisis and trauma. Unfortunately, the crisis of the bombs, and there's a lot of, yeah, violence that happens. I don't want to give it away, but I, I think I was interested in showing how she could kind of find her power. And there are other, there are two other female characters in the book who are secondary characters. One is a singer called, her name's Stella Holiday, and then, um, one of the owners of the zoo, her name is Josephine Christie, and they're both without children. And I kind of did that intentionally just so that she could have some role models of people who weren't having kids. And uh, yeah, I think for myself, as I moved through my own journey, it was important to find role models of people um, who were, yeah, making other choices. Um, Kirk, you, you brought up that there's a crisis here and, and, you know, for the, for those of you in the audience, we don't want to give away the ending, but I mean, we know it's set during World War II, so we know, you know, enough about World War II, but we don't know what happens to Hattie in this case or to Ada for that matter. So um, in each of these novels, um, the main character is looking for refuge. Um, in The Elephant of Belfast, those air raids cause Hetty to, quote, tremble at the irony of danger, how she could have died crushed by an elephant rather than by a collapsing shelter or a falling bomb. Um, in Outlawed, Ada, she seeks to escape persecution from her own community and later from convent life, but... She wonders if, quote, she should have stayed in the convent where she could have done useful work, learn what she could from the library and harm to no one. So as authors, um, how did you decipher these contradictions and the irony between danger and refuge? You know, maybe what they're trying to go toward ends up being just as dangerous as what they're running from. Um. Yeah, I mean, in in the case of in the case of Outlaws, certainly, um, you know, there is a lot of tension in the book between, um, you know, Ada sort of seeking safety and then, um, you know, ultimately also, you know, there's her search for safety on the one hand, but also sort of her search for self-determination. And I think, you know, it sounds like this this sort of broader theme of women looking for self-determination is threaded through um, is threaded through the Elephant of Belfast, too. Um, but in Ada's case, um, you know, there comes a point fairly early on in the book where she has to choose, you know, she's found a place that will give her a little bit of security, but it's not a place where she can do what she feels she's meant to do in life. It's not a place where she can, you know, maybe she can seek knowledge, um, but she can't necessarily disseminate it to other people. She can't practice, you know, her medical career. She can't be a midwife. She can't be any of these things. And so she sort of has to decide if she's going to stay there or if she's going to continue on her journey. Um, and, you know, yeah, I mean, that is, it's sort of a, it's a pivotal decision. It's a decision without which we wouldn't have a book, you know, it would just like stop after page, after chapter two, or it would be a very different kind of book. I mean, it's interesting to think about, um, you know, essentially in chapter two, she's in a convent. And so what would sort of that cloistered life look like for her? And, you know, perhaps that would be a life of physical safety, but a life where, um, you know, so perhaps intellectually and even spiritually, she would be kind of at risk. She wouldn't be able to do sort of what what she's meant to do in life. Um, you know, so I, I think, um, you know, throughout my books, I've always kind of been inspired by sort of hero stories and wanting to retell some of these hero stories with different kinds of heroes, often with female heroes. Um, and often, you know, in, you know, the Odyssey or whatever, um, you know, we see we see the hero sort of having to leave home to make his usually his way in the world and having to leave a safe place to make his way in the world. Um, and so here in Outlawed, um, you know, 
we not only have Ada having to leave home, but then having to leave the only other place that's going to offer her any safety um, in order to kind of become the person that she wants to be. So that's that's sort of, I think, one of the central tensions in the book. Yeah, as I said, I, it's really, well, the Easter Tuesday bombings when the city is devastated that Hetty's well, she has kind of two things that are driving her, saving the elephant and finding where her mom might be, whose name is Rose. And I think I was, yeah, just how in crisis and in trauma, one can find more direction and purpose. And I think that's what happens for Hetty. And I was, I, so I lived in New York City for a long time. We moved down to Texas in 2004. And so we did live in the city when September 11th happened. And a lot of the bombings and the violence that I write about is are inspired by having lived in Manhattan during that time. And I was, worked at Lincoln Center, so I wasn't um, right in the thick of it. You know, we all were in a way, but I did have a friend who was a reporter for the New York Times and her beat was City Hall and covering Mayor Giuliani. So basically her marching orders was to go find him. And then I had another friend who uh, worked for Motorola who had set up the command center for FEMA that had been destroyed during the bombings. And he had to set up the new FEMA control center on the pier. And these are friends, you know, I think I didn't see them for about a week, but it felt like a year um, because of everything that happened. And I think I was thinking a little bit about them, you know, how they had to do their jobs amid the devastation. And I think for me, I was really, you know, Hetty is experiencing grief at the beginning of the novel. And then as the city moves through this tragedy, there is a collective public grief that's everywhere. And, you know, how does she negotiate her private grief within uh, amid that backdrop? And, you know, at the time of September 11th, I was still young, so I hadn't had like major life losses yet. Um, I hadn't gone through the infertility experience yet, but I did get to witness the grief of New York City and it was a profound experience. And I think for me, when it happened, I didn't think, oh, I'm going to write a novel someday about this. I, you know, basically was just hoping the city would somehow recalibrate, which eventually it did. But now we're at another kind of um, time of loss. And I think we're all asking, how, how is the city going to redefine itself? And I think on a character level um, with Hetty, you know, she gets her life changes immensely by the end of the book, but yet she gets herself back in the process or she figures out who she is. And, you know, as fiction writers, you know, we're always asking ourselves, how do our characters change? And, um, you know, hopefully the reader is engaged so that they want to know what's going to happen next too. Right. You, you know, you mentioned that, we're in a time of um, crisis right now and, and reading both of these books. Um, I thought of that because in Outlawed, um, Ada, you know, there are periods where there's she talks about the great flu or she talks about um, a measles outbreak. And there are periods where her sisters cannot go to school and they are quarantined, basically. Right. So I thought about, um, Anna, when you were writing the book, um, I mean, I know it came out in January, but when you were writing the book, I'm, I'm just assuming this was, you know, not on your mind about our, our quarantine now. And um, as Kirk Walsh, in your book, there is there's so many parallels, you know, I mean, we don't have official official rationing of food during the pandemic, but certainly there are times when people go to the grocery store and they're allowed to buy only a certain number of things. So, you know, though you were writing this before the pandemic, 
has your writing been uh, will this affect your writing in the future, you know, having experienced this pandemic now? And, and how do you kind of look back on your characters now that they're out in the world? It's interesting, um, Kirk, it's interesting that, um, you know, you bring up that experience with with 9-11. Um, I didn't live in New York yet on 9-11. I moved here in, in 2009. Um, <clears throat> but something that's really been on my mind a lot, I know I've lived here um, you know, throughout this whole this whole last year, and um, something that's been on my mind a lot have been the parallels and the differences between 9/11 and this pandemic. Um, I mean, one thing, for example, and I wrote about this in my journalistic work, but um, you know, after 9/11, people came together for public um, mourning um, and to publicly share their grief with one another. There were vigils um, where people could could mourn together. Um, and we haven't really been able to have that in the same way because it isn't safe. Um, you know, so the city had like a COVID-19 day of remembrance. Um, there were some in-person outdoor components, but mostly it was online. Um, and so it's this really different experience where we've sort of had to, um, in a lot of ways, cope with things in isolation. Um, and we haven't had the opportunity to understand as easily what our neighbors are going through. Um, so I think that's something that people are going to be kind of working out and working through for a long time. Um, I'm not sure what role art um, or writing will have to play in that, because um, I think you know we're all trying to figure that out, too. Um, I mean, I, I will say, so I had finished um, basically everything but the copy edits on my book when the pandemic really hit New York. Like, I remember, I mean, I've told this story on panels, but I remember going, um, like, going to my local coffee shop with, like, a stack of pages, you know, in the copy editor's notes. And this was in, like, March 2020 or February 2020. And I brought, like, my bleach wipes and my hand sanitizer. And, like, everyone there was talking about COVID. And then I was like, oh, this is going to be the last time I'm in this coffee shop for a really long time. Um, and actually, I just went back to it yesterday for the first time. I didn't sit, but I did get coffee and like a, and a cookie and left. And so it's like, you know, things are starting to lurch back to some form of normalcy, but it's going to still take a long time. Um, and I really as a writer, I'm going to be really interested to hear, you know, how you have been have been thinking about this because for me as a writer, I think um, the pandemic has kind of thrown a wrench into like, what do you consider reality or what do you consider the present? I mean, when we think about, you know, you think about writing a story set in like the contemporary United States, you know, before March of 2020, it would look one way. And then after March of 2020, it looks really different. Um, you know, so I was sort of starting to inch toward a new project and it was going to be set in the present. But then as soon as the pandemic hit, I really had to put it on ice for a while because I was like, is everyone going to be wearing masks? Are they going to be in isolation? Are people going to be dying of COVID-19 in this world? Like, what world is this set in? Um, and I've only sort of started to approach it again, um, you know, now, like a year later. I mean, part of that is also just I didn't have any time in 2020, as, as many people didn't, um, or brain space. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's going to rewire a lot of us and what our concerns are and what our approaches are and, you know, how we think about our world and how we think about, um, you know, the same kinds of conceptions of safety that we were talking about. I think, you know, we to, to varying degrees have all been profoundly unsafe in the last year and that changes you. And it's, you know, it, it's been a trauma that hasn't been able to be shared yet, but it is a shared trauma in some ways. and so. Yeah, I mean, it's something that we're all going to be processing for a long time, maybe the rest of our lives. Right, right. Yeah, I definitely, um, it's something I've been thinking a lot about. Um, and I think because of my book, you know, is kind of examining a character who is dealing with private and public grief. And I think, yeah, in New York City, it was, I just remember being in Central Park, you know, it, these beautiful blue sky days, but there was a smell of burning in the air. But yet we were all experiencing it. And as you said, we were seeing each other. We were outside. And um, yeah, I almost, you know, the Black Lives Matter, you know, marches 
were important in so many ways, but I think one way it was important is that people were outside and could express their rage at the injustices that are happening. Um, and I think for me, I've had a weird experience because um, I got, I did my last revision in March of 2019 through January 2019. Um, my dad died November 20th and then my mom died 10 weeks later. And so the last normal thing I did was go to my mom's funeral on March 14th. And um, so I was really like not having it. <laughs> You know, I was just like, I can't believe I cannot hug my friends. Like, this is ridiculous. You know, I, I was resisting the reality. And then eventually I gave in and I realized, oh, this is the reality. I'm not going to see my friends. Um, but I did really have to experience my isolated grief in a pretty intense way at the beginning of the pandemic. And it was hard. I mean, I, I, really struggled and then it started to lift and you know it's as Anna said um, I think our kind of personal negotiations and our creative kind of dialogue with the pandemic will be lifelong and you know my next book I think um, I mean I started it in October 2019 um, before my life changed um, and it is about Detroit during World War II. And there is some events that happened that are a little similar to the insurrection. And so I feel like I'm writing about something that's contemporary, but it's not. And I think some part of me, you know, with my Belfast novel, I wanted to be in another reality. I wanted to, um, sort of be with characters who don't have access to technology. Um, and, you know, in the meantime, I have written short stories that are contemporary, but I think for the not longer form, which, you know, it takes me up to five years to write a book. So I like kind of being in the material that, um, but yeah, it could change. Um, but it is a really, I appreciated what you said, Anna, like, I don't know, it's like we each um, have been shaped by this experience and it's gonna, I don't know what it's gonna be like for us as writers. I mean, I, I think we're all gonna find out as we kind of keep moving through it. Right. Thank you. Um, I noticed that, you know, uh, part of, uh, for these characters, uh, they're each without their mothers. Um, they're each uh, experiencing, you know, an absent father. Um, they also don't have brothers, right? And both of them. And then each of them uh, in in uh, the Belfast, uh, Elephant of Belfast, um, Hetty has to, I won't give the, the ending away, but Hetty has to rely on um, some nuns to help her. And then in Outlawed, Anna, um, Ada also relies on some nuns. And I and I thought, wow, this is another parallel. You know, convents come up in both of these. And I've always been fascinated. I'm, I was raised Catholic. I went to St. Mary's University, which is a small Catholic university here in San Antonio. And I've always been fascinated by how Nuns are about a thousand times more progressive than people believe they are. And so I really enjoyed how strong and powerful and uh, almost stealthy these care these nuns are. So how did you come to write about these nuns, each of you? Um, yeah, I mean, so for me, I actually, um, a big influence on this book was a book called Lieutenant Nun, um, which is about, it's um, a real life memoir by someone who was born in the late 1500s and lived into the 1600s. Um, this person um, was born in Spain um, and um, entered a convent, um, assigned female at birth and entered a convent alongside, um, you know, the other daughters in her family, 
um, which was sort of what a family of their class and station at the time would do. The girls go to the convent, either they get married, you know, they, the, uh, the family arranges a marriage, or they just stay in the convent and live out their li lives as nuns. Um, but uh, the person who wrote this memoir um, at the time, her name was Catalina de Arauso, um, she decides she, she's not going to do that. So she cuts off all of her hair, refashions her habit into a pair of breeches, and then goes and lives lives his life as a man for the next many years, travels to the new world, becomes actually a criminal and murders lots of people, a sort of a swashbuckling outlaw. Um, and then at a certain point actually returns to the convent, says, I've been a woman this whole time. I'm actually, I'm a virgin. I've never married. I can retake my vows. I can retake, you know, the cloth. Um, but then she goes to see like the religious authorities and says, actually, I've changed my mind again. I'd like a special like papal dispensation to live as a man for the rest of my days. And, and he gets it. And then at wow. that point he kind of disappears from history and we don't know, but, but there's reports that maybe he lived as Antonio Diaz and went back to the new world. Um, anyway, again, this like fascinating story that happened in the 1500s and the 1600s, um, you know, and so that story I think told me two things. One you know, something that I to some degree already knew and certainly should have already known that, you know, the idea of someone um, identifying as a different gender than than they were assigned is by no means new and has always been something that that is someone's experience, um, that gender fluidity and potentially identifying in different ways at different times has always been part of human experience. Um, and then also just the role, you know, the role of the convent. So in reading this book, um, you know, and actually learning a little bit, my husband is um, is a historian, a history teacher, and learning a bit, bit more about his historical research. Just the role of convents throughout history has always been fascinating in a way that I, as a non-Catholic, really didn't know. Um, often a place of social change and often a place of refuge for people who, for whatever reason, um, you know, were not safe in outside society, whether it was because their families rejected them for political reasons, if they were divorced by their husbands, if they were abused, um, you know, so, so really this sort of like, you know, all female space or usually all female space, um, that kind of could cluster around and offer safety to people who didn't have safety in the male dominated world. Um, you know, and there are people who have written about this really, you know, very eloquently, much more so than I can speak about it, but it was really fascinating to me and that informed, um, you know, to some degree the nuns chapter of the book, but then really also most of the book, which is about, you know, primarily female and non-binary societies. And there's, I mean, as you say, very few char male characters in the book at all, which wasn't really by design, but was in part because they just was very interested in exploring, um, you know, societies that have always existed that have not been male dominated. Right. Thank you. Yeah, I noted the kind of intersection of nuns and convents in both our books. And for me, um, the nuns and the convent scene kind of came later in the revision process when I was trying to figure out where the elephant could be hidden. <laughs> um, and I was interested in kind of continuing to explore the Catholic Protestant conflict. And so um, Hetty's Protestant and there's, yeah, some, the storyline kind of related to that, but it just sort of dovetailed neatly into what I was exploring already. And um, yeah, as I mentioned, I come from a Catholic family and my grandmother kind of was, was the original inspiration for Hetty. Um, my great uncle was an all-American football player who uh, played at University of Michigan. And at the peak of his career, when he was 22, he died in a car accident. And my grandmother was 19 at the time. And she turned to Catholicism. She went to mass every day. Um, she wasn't a nun. She became a social worker. But I kind of had her in mind. I mean, I was looking, like I said, to create strong female characters for Hetty to be surrounded by. Um, also, there are a lot of children who have been taken in by the nuns and I did kind of see children as the novel can be sad at times. And I kind of found the children as a vehicle to bring a little bit more levity into the novel. And as Anna was talking, I was sort of 
thinking about my own, I mean, I don't have combat experience, but my husband is a high school teacher and we took a trip with the kids from his school down to Nicaragua. And we, uh, some of the service work was at the Sisters of Charity convent in Nicaragua. And so, and I did meet a nun there who was a very kind person who had had a life or death experience. And that's why she turned her life over um, to God. And I, I, I guess somewhere, you know, so many things kind of work their way into our fiction and we don't quite yeah. know where they're coming from. But, um, you know, there's kind of my grandmother and my background as a Catholic. I mean, I'm not practicing Catholic anymore, but um, yeah, just, I, it just, it felt like a gift actually in the book. Cause it, like I said, it came later in the revision process and I kind of love the nuns. So. They, like I said, they're always so progressive, so strong. Um, I just want to remind our attendees to please put your questions in um, the chat or the Q&A box on the right side of your screen. Um, we do have one question. Um, Anna, Elizabeth DeLeon asked, could you repeat the name of the Spanish nun's memoir? Sure. It's called Lieutenant Nun. Um, and um, the name the name of the nun, her, her birth name was Catalina de Arauso, E-R-A-U-S-O. So if you Google that or if you just Google Lieutenant Nun, um, you'll find it. It's very short. It's fascinating. Great. Thank you. We also want to remind our attendees to please look to um, your screen for a button on um, purchasing these books. We hope you'll consider purchasing Anna North and S. Kirk Walsh's book from the Nowhere Bookshop. It's the book festival's bookseller and independent bookstores have had a hard time during the pandemic. So we hope you'll support them and these writers and the festival by purchasing their excellent books. Um, just click on the buy the book button on the festival site. Uh, I'm not sure it's on the screen that you're on right now, but it's on the festival site. And um, I have just one more question, I think. Um, I have time for it. In each of the books, there's kind of, you know, we were talking about how these communities uh, are the places where there's danger as well as refuge. But in each of them, it seems like the community has a lot of folk wisdom to, to offer. Um, and in Outlawed, you know, the Ada's mother, Avalyn is a midwife. She teaches Ada so much about learning the process of herbal uh, medicine, of stages of, of giving birth and all of that. But then she's also in a community that harms her by spreading rumors. Um, and in the Elephant of Belfast, um, this community, as you said, her, that, you know, has all this um, tension between the Protestants and the Catholics. And, you know, when she's going into a different neighborhood, she's highly aware of the fact that she'll be treated differently. Um, there's one woman who says, you know, I know who you are and you're just one of them. So how did you write about these communities? Uh, you know, because it's historical fiction, you had to look to knowing what that community would have been like in that year. How did you do that? You want to start? Okay. Um, so, I, yeah, I, when I went to Bel, I actually did my research trip to Belfast in 2013. And when I went almost, and I interviewed survivors of the Blitz during that time, I went to the zoo, I went to different historical institutions who a lot of people helped me. But when I asked the question, what was going on, um, you know, with the Catholic Protestant conflict during that time, they said it was not happening. <laughs> so they did not want to talk about it. Um, that said, um, I was really fortunate to connect with a historian and scholar named Brian Barton, who is the foremost historian of the Blitz. And he helped me immensely with kind of the nuances because it is present. It's not the main theme of the book, but it is present in a lot of the scenes. And it does sort of, um, add to the turning points in the book. And I, I'm, I really relied on what happened 
um, I wasn't trying to suggest it was more elevated than it was. It really was based on some true events that some of them I moved around a little bit, but I, I did try um, to be pretty true to life. And, you know, Anna had a sister, you know, part of it is that she's married a Catholic and her mom will no longer, she has not seen the granddaughter since her um, daughter died in childbirth. And, you know, my grandmother, who I mentioned, she did not marry the person she wanted to because he wasn't Catholic. So I think, you know, just having seen that, what interfaith marriage, that that can create strife in families on a personal level, but just how it rings out in communities and yeah, Anna. <laughs> Um, I did a research trip too for, for my book. I went to, um, it's so interesting to hear about yours. I, I went to, um, Wyoming and Colorado and I went to the real life, um, site of the Hole in the Wall Gang hideout, um, which is in, in the Hole in the Wall Valley, um, in Eastern Wyoming. Um, and I also went to a museum there that, um, you know, had a lot of sort of outlaw paraphernalia and outlaw trivia. And I, I sort of got a lot of texture there. The only other thing I'll say about my research and sort of communities is that a big part of my research was about midwifery and about herbal remedies and other types of home remedies, because it's not a time, you know, in, in alternate 1894 or real 1894. In real life, 1894 was sort of the beginning of kind of like the medical, you know, doctors coming into the delivery room and really kicking midwives out. Um, this hasn't happened in the story of my book. And so we still have. Um, you know, midwives kind of kind of being the main birth practitioners. And at the time, they didn't have antibiotics or, you know, Pitocin or any of the kind of things they have. So researching the herbs that they would have really given, you know, some of which, a lot of which are still used as herbal remedies today. A lot of people might be familiar with fenugreek, which is still something that your doctor will tell you to take if your milk supply is low. Um, you know, so that was a really fun aspect of my research, too, was learning these sort of um, you know, the kinds of remedies that were, you know, have been practiced to some degree for centuries. Great. Thank you. So to our attendees, again, on the festival website, use the link to buy the book from our Nowhere Bookshop or your local independent bookstore. Um, thank you so much, attendees. Thank you, Anna North. Thank you, S. Kirk Walsh, for joining the San Antonio Book Festival. And again, we encourage our attendees look more into these wonderful historical novels. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.